What's going on everybody? Trey for Payback in the building. Coming at you guys with part two of first day of the Daryl Brooks trial. I want to say thank you guys for all the wonderful comments y'all are leaving and thank you for clearing up a lot of stuff. Someone left a comment clearing up the thing about his mom. I thought his mom at some point would have to come and like testify but apparently not. And you know me I don't really have any updates to give but I do want to say if you enjoy the video please like share and subscribe. Do all that good stuff man. That's about it. We're gonna go ahead and get into it. It's gonna be another pretty long episode. The last one was only a couple hours. I don't know how long this one will be. Let's get into it. Yo, we starting off this <laughs> on a quiet tantrum. What's he even mad about now? Like, what's it? I'm tripping for even trying to understand. I'm. I need to just chill out. I forgot. It's no method to this madness that he has. It's. It just is what it is. Make sure this is capturing audio. Hope y'all are doing good. I know it's a storm coming through. Some of y'all are in Florida and stuff. I saw some comments from some people saying they were in Florida. I hope y'all are still doing good and staying safe uh, throughout all that. Hope the damage isn't anything serious. I'm not sure how many days it is either in this trial. It's a lot of stuff I really should just be looking up beforehand. But I mean, I, I got, <laughs> y'all are giving me like mad information every time I, I do one of these and I really appreciate it. I read those comments. I thank, I thank you guys for all that stuff. I think the judge is coming back out now. I wish she would go ahead and chain them to the chair. I remember she said they would do that at one point. Does the state have an opening statement? And just for the record, um, Mr. Brooks is appearing from the other courtroom. Uh, that should not influence your verdict in any way, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Go ahead, Attorney Richard. I just when we do that, make sure we confirm I, it should transmit, but I'll make sure it's transmitting over there as well. Um, just and if that's okay, if it happens, um, we may lose video of Mr. Brooks for the time being, um, as the state is using what appears to be a PowerPoint. Um, just confirm with me. Uh, Deputy Whitted, that uh, when it starts, that it is able to be viewed uh, and heard over there. Go ahead. It was a cold. We can't see it. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let me do this. Um, no one needs to leave. We're going to go off the record, though, uh, so that I can set up uh, another way to do this so that there's a share screen capability. Okay. Uh, we have the technology problem solved. Uh, so go ahead. The state may present its opening statement. All right. It was a cold, windy Sunday afternoon in November. Thousands of people were bundling up and going downtown to watch the annual Waukesha Christmas Parade. The event started off normal. There were dance teams, high school marching bands, local community groups, local businesses, all making their way down the parade route. The streets were lined with friends and family members and neighbors, people there to soak up the atmosphere. Kids ran into the street to grab candy from people who were throwing it from the parades. It sounds corny, but I think you'll see from the videos, there was a true sense of joy in the air. Daryl Brooks killed that joy. He replaced it with terror, trauma, and death. The evidence is going to show that Mr. Brooks left behind a trail of carnage and chaos as he made his way down Main Street through the parade route. The evidence will show that he left that crime scene, created that crime scene, in fact, because he was fleeing from another one, one where he had laid his hands on a woman and where police involvement became inevitable. So as he careened this down the definition of a coward, bro. from curb to curb, he just ran away from putting his hands on a woman and then ran through like, and he, even if you look at his, uh, the victims and stuff, the people that he was hitting with the car as kids, older people, like, it, it's just crazy. It's just crazy. Hands glued to the steering wheel, eyes fixed on the road in front of him with a silent rage on his face. He hit the gas with his red Ford Escape and used it as a battering ram over and over again, striking men, women, and kids. In the end, Mr. Brooks killed six people. He injured dozens more and left a permanent scar on this community. We and it's stuff like this that makes it you over the next several days in chronological phases. It makes me weary when I go out to like public events and stuff. Because me and my girl will we'll go out to public events and I'm always I'm dialed in like set the scene with <laughs> looking around like okay what are they doing? What are they? Not to be like creepy, but hey, what's that? Why he got his hands like that? What's <laughs> you know? He was the incident commander. You don't know what people are trying to do these days, unfortunately. We are going to, with Sergeant Wanner's help, take you through this, which is the first of three maps that we will refer to repeatedly throughout this trial. This map depicts the area that we're going to be talking about over the next couple of days, the parade route. Now, for those of you not entirely familiar with downtown Waukesha, this is going to look like a bunch of gibberish, but once we get going and we repeatedly refer to these street names and the business names and the groups that were involved okay. in this parade, I think it'll become like a second language to you. Sergeant I'm Warner will describe for you the how the, the parade route ran uh, from, if you look closely at the screens in front of you, the intersection of Main Street and White Rock Avenue. White Rock was a staging area for the parade groups and floats. And they made their way southeast on White Rock until they came to Main Street and then they would make a right turn and head southeast down Main Street through the parade route until the very end as it wraps around to the south and runs into Wisconsin Avenue. The parade route then would continue to the east, making a left-hand turn on Wisconsin, but nothing really happens on Wisconsin Avenue. You're not going to hear any testimony about that. As you can see from this map, it depicts or represents uh, each intersection where a squad car or a police officer was stationed. They're denoted by the little badge shields uh, in the intersections. If you look closely, you can see little red lines, and Sergeant Wanner will describe how those represent the barricades that were placed at each intersection 
for security and safety purposes. Once we've got that established, we're going to move into the first chapter of this story, and you're going to hear about the origin of Mr. Brooks's rage that day. A violent domestic argument with Erica Patterson, his former girlfriend and the mother of his child. Erica Patterson is going to testify either today or tomorrow, hopefully today. She's going to tell you that in November of 2021, she was staying at the women's video. which is a shelter here in Waukesha. And on the day in question, November 21st of 2021, the defendant showed up in Waukesha in his red Ford Escape that she knew he drove, and he argued with her, and he harassed her, and he punched her in the face. And the thing about a swollen eye is it's tough to fake. You're going to hear evidence about how after, uh, well, let me back up. You're going to hear evidence about how the defendant took Erica Patterson all over town that afternoon, from Frame Park, across the river, up Barstow. A lot of y'all warned me in the comments that this was going to get rougher too, and I see exactly what you're saying. Though. Go Hill, back down to Frame Park. I see exactly what you mean. And at some it's point, after worse. she was struck, after she sustained that injury, Erica called her friends because she needed help, and she had no one else to call. One of those friends is Corey Runkle. You're going to hear from Corey on the witness stand in this trial. Corey's going to say that she was Erica's roommate at the Women's Center. She had known Erica for a few weeks and they had grown close. And when she got the call from Erica that Erica needed help, Corey immediately responded to help. And she ended up finding Erica and Daryl Brooks in front of the White Rock School. We go back, the White Rock School is on White Rock Avenue. It's on near the top right portion of the map. It's just south of Frame Park. And Corey is going to talk about how she, she found Erica and the defendant at this, at this location, and she got into both a physical and a verbal altercation with Mr. Brooks. That altercation is captured on surveillance video, two surveillance videos, actually. You're going to wow. see both of them. You're going to see how the defendant was reacting that day. You're going to see what he looked like, what he was wearing, the red Ford Escape that he was driving. You're going to see how the defendant reacted once Erica's friends showed up and he lost his physical advantage over a woman. Erica and Corey will also testify that at some point during this scuffle, the police were called. And you're going to see a separate video, a squad video, from the responding officer that shows just down the block there was a marked squad car with its lights flashing, marking the entrance to the parade something that people in front of White Rock School would have seen. So the evidence is going to show that the defendant must have known once things got loud and once there was more than just him and Erica on scene, the police were going to show up. Right. So he took the coward's way out. You're going to see him in the video get into the driver's seat of that red SUV. Corey and Erica will tell you that no one else was in the car and you're going to see him pull off on White Rock towards Main Street. You're going to hear from law enforcement officers who were positioned along the parade route, the officers who made their initial contact with the defendant. The first. That's wild. I didn't even know it was other people involved in the. So I knew, um, I knew there was some kind of scuffle with his girlfriend and then, or his ex-girlfriend, and that led to him speeding off. But I didn't know it was like other, she had friends and stuff that were involved. I don't know if they were all fighting him. And then he was losing or something and jumped in the car and ran off. Or, but first one that's just crazy. Tried to stop him. And the first one. I told you this dude is, the lead he's one of those types where when he doesn't get his way, if he's losing something, him. everybody he's has to feel it. Or that's how he that feels. Day, as security for the parade, he was Man working Man and White Rock. He's the first law enforcement officer to come into contact with the defendant during this incident, face to face, or I would, I think, better describe it as face to windshield. You know, if he getting beat up by some women, he definitely wouldn't. So much a man can do against an SUV. 
But he's going to tell you that he got so close, he got such a good look at Daryl Brooks' face that from that witness stand, he'll be able to say to you definitive, definitively, Daryl Brooks, the man in orange on the video screen, is the man who was driving the red SUV in this case. You're going to hear from a few more officers. Uh, Officer Bryce Butcher and Officer Sonia Schneider. They were positioned at the intersection of Main Street and East Avenue, just a little bit further southwest uh, in that map. You're going to hear them describe how they saw this red SUV approaching. They quickly realized it was not part of the parade. They quickly realized this was a problem. There are people, children, in the street, lining the street. And so they jumped into action. They tried to stop it. As the, barrel, as the SUV started barreling towards them, Officer Butcherin again tried to get in the way. He put himself at risk trying to get in front of the vehicle. Couldn't stop it. Officer Schneider tried to redirect the vehicle up Buckley Street, making a right-hand turn. She'll tell you, and you'll see in the video, there was room. There was space. She couldn't do it. The defendant blew Wait. Up. Hold on, She'll I'm just trying to understand that second video, part There was room. So wait, was there room for... Right hand turn. She'll and he tell just you, chose to drive video, through... There was room. Wow. There was space. I'm not going to keep here. rewinding it, but that's... The defendant blew past her. And that's when... That's some despicable the stuff. The in the police radio start. You're going to hear from Jim Hawkinson the battalion chief for the Waukesha Fire Department. He's going to tell you about I'm the ready to see the scope citizen, of the emergency, to be emergency response to this tragedy. He was in charge of the fire department that day. He's going to tell you about all of the units that had to respond to the scene. The massive amount of resources needed to triage and treat and transport all the victims. He's going to tell you about the response from other communities in southeast Wisconsin, the mutual aid call that went out, and all the other communities that came to help out. He's going to tell you about how Waukesha Memorial Hospital, just up the hill from the parade route, quickly reached capacity. And so everybody had to be diverted to other medical facilities. We'll transition then into the next chapter of this story, and you're going to hear from some of the people whose lives were forever changed by the defendant's terrible decisions that day. But I'll tell you right now, you're not going to hear from all of them. It wouldn't make sense. It's not necessary. There's so many. We intend to present the evidence to you in an efficient and streamlined way. We will elicit testimony and introduce exhibits that cover every element of every single criminal charge in this case. But our goal is to avoid duplication of evidence and to avoid undue hardship on the victims and the witnesses who have already suffered so much. So the first witness in this part of the trial that you're going to hear from is Nicole White. She's the very first person, aside from Detective Casey, who was struck by the defendant on that day. She's going to tell you, as we look at this second of the three maps that we're going to repeatedly refer to, that she was marching with her co-workers and friends with uh, Remax. You'll recognize the float, I think, in the videos because just like the commercials for Remax, there's a giant hot air balloon that shoots fire out of the basket, which is pretty cool. And she's gonna tell you, she was watch, cool. mar marching with her friends and her co-workers when, without any warning, she was hit from behind and knocked over. You're gonna see video of that. Nicole White has a, a special significance in this case because, as the first person who was struck, she represents the point in time when Mr. Brooks was legally required to stop. You heard the judge read the, the hit and run jury instructions. And to summarize, in Wisconsin, anybody who's operating a motor vehicle who's involved in some kind of accident, they have a duty to stop, to investigate, to exchange information. Not only did Daryl Brooks not stop, the evidence will show that he sped up. The evidence will show that as his body count increased, so did his motive to get away. Nicole White, I think, is a good point here uh, for me to 
explain to you or to summarize for you the charge of first degree recklessly endangering safety. Now again, the judge read the law to you off morning and a lot of the afternoon and she's gonna read it to you again at the end of the case and you're gonna have a binder with all these instructions written down for you so you do not need to memorize them, okay? But we're gonna talk about first degree recklessly endangering safety. It's a crime where it's committed by someone who recklessly endangers the safety of another human being under circumstances that show utter disregard for human life. Let's talk about what the state's not required to prove with recklessly endangering safety. Not required to prove injury. This was a conscious decision in our charging decision. We're not gonna get into medical records, we're not gonna talk about the details of witnesses' injuries because it's not relevant, except to the extent that it proves that they were uh, endangered and resulted in injury. But we don't need to get into who was hit or how hard or how long they've suffered. We just are going to prove to you that their safety was endangered. So, after Nicole White, we are going to talk, you're gonna hear evidence about the first uh, of the larger groups that was affected by this incident, the Waukesha South High School Marching Band. 10 kids in that band got either hit or run over. Here's the first example of our efficient presentation of evidence. You're not gonna hear from any one of them. High school aged kids. This is the part that I touched on in the first part. I, I said, um, I know he did something. He had hit a bunch of kids, like it was some kind of marching band or something like that, man. And it's just, it just further proves like he has zero regard for any human life whatsoever, bro. And it just, it, that's why the fact that he's even trying to get out of this, like seeing him trying so many different things to try to wiggle out of this, it disgusts me in itself, just seeing him like trying all these different tactics. Oh, I don't get this, I don't understand that. Uh, I request a mistrial and all this weird stuff. It's like, bro, do you realize you took people's family members away from them forever and you talking about you trying to win, um, you trying to finesse a way to be free again? Like, I just don't, it's a level of like griminess and darkness to it. I just can't There's really video comprehend showing I know I keep saying this stuff, but it's over. like. So instead you're going to hear from their band director. Like at what point do you just Sarah take a look at yourself and say, yo, I really did this stuff. Like they still shots of the video. They're sitting here in front of him saying everything he did and he's still staring like listen to the video, shaking his head and all this stuff. And it'll be clear as day who's like, getting what? run over or hit. It'll be clear as day whose safety was endangered by Mr. Brooks that day. As we move further down the parade route, you'll hear evidence about the Burris Logistics Group. You'll hear uh, testimony from Kelly Grabo about how she was marching with that group along with her young daughter. You'll see video of them. They're dressed up uh, like the Who's from Whoville. You'll <laughs> see them get hit. As we move further down the parade route, you'll hear testimony about the Green family. They're spectators along the parade route. Charles Green is going to come in and talk about how he was there with his family. He was sitting on the southeast corner of Maine and Gasper across the street from Martha Merrill's books. He'll talk about how his kids were seated on a, a portable bench, something that you bring to a parade to sit on, and how they got knocked off that bench when the defendant ran into them. The next point um, in the presentation of evidence will involve the Waukesha Blazers. I think it's important to point out you can't consider this evidence of each crime in a vacuum. You need to consider the entire incident. Because at this point, by the time we get to the blazers, the defendant will have already hit or run over 15 people. You'll see in the video that at this point the defendant has actually increased his speed. And you'll hear from Detective Mike Carpenter with the Waukesha Police Department. He's gonna come in and talk about speed analysis. He'll tell you that he's certified to use a software program that basically takes surveillance video, measures the amount of time it takes to travel a certain distance in that video, and calculates an average speed over that distance. And he'll tell you that in video obtained from Bosco Social Club, which is 
right in front of where the blazers got hit. He'll tell you that that video in that area right before the blazers got hit, the defendant was traveling in excess of 33 miles an hour. There were five victims in, in the blazers. That includes Jackson Sparks, who was watching, walking with his big brother Tucker. Cut down in the road before he had a chance to put any miles on his soul. Jackson was eight. He died two days later in the hospital. I think this is a good point to talk about the law. I really hope this dude gets what's coming to him, bro. I, I really do. I really, 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 really do. First degree intentional homicide. I hope them Again, inmates the give him a very provided warm the law welcome. to you. It'll be provided to you again at the conclusion of the trial. I want you to take a look at that second element. I don't know what the defense in this case is going to be. In fact, the defendant isn't required to put one on at all. He can sit there and not and say I don't a word like throughout this trial, crazy about people and that's like perfectly that, within his right, and you can't hold that against him. And in fact, if we, if he does that and we don't prove each and every one of these counts to you beyond a reasonable doubt, you must find him not guilty. That's the law. But if he does choose to present a defense, if he does raise any issues, I expect that he will likely claim that he didn't mean to kill these people. Take a look at that second bullet point. Keep that in mind. As you're watching these videos, as you're learning about how this parade unfolded, consider whether the defendant was aware that his conduct was practically certain to cause the death of another human being. We're going to move further down the parade route, and the next group after the Blazers is the Extreme Dance Group. There were girls of really all ages in this group, from Toddlers being pulled in strollers up to high school age teenage dancers. 15 victims, 15 people associated with this group either got hit or were very close to getting hit. That doesn't include two additional spectators who were watching the parade from the south side of Main Street near the Five Points intersection, right in front of the, of the extreme dance team as the defendant drove through. Girls in this dance group suffered catastrophic injuries. The group of victims also includes parents, grandparents, siblings, people marching with the group, but not necessarily as dancers. You're not gonna hear from everybody who got hit. You're gonna hear from the two instructors, the two young ladies who were tasked with teaching these girls these routines and marching with them and encouraging them and comforting them after the fact. And I know that's going to be in that's the video. Be identify for you where all these girls are positioned, and it'll be very clear the path of travel of the vehicle as it goes through that group of young ladies who was hit and who was nearly hit. The next uh, group down the parade route is Citizens Bank, and here we reach the second count of intentional homicide. Jane Kulik was marching with Citizens Bank with her friends, with her co-workers. This is the only count of homicide for which there is no clear video depicting how she died. So instead of watching video, you're going to hear evidence. Oh, God. You hear somebody in the background crying. This is just wild, man. From her co-worker and from the man who was driving the truck pulling this float. And they're really the ones who are in the best position to observe exactly what happened to Jane Kulik as the defendant plowed through that parade route. And they're going to describe for you how she was struck, how she was run over. The medical examiner will explain that Jane Kulik's cause of death was multiple blunt force traumatic injuries. She's... We'll move further down Southwest 
along the parade route. And we'll learn about a group that was standing in front of the steaming cup, spectators again. Innocent people who had nothing to do with anything. They had nothing to do with his, his raggedy life and the fact that he felt like he had no control over uh, his ex-girlfriend and all that stuff. Ain't, ain't that crazy? His life was going and his life was in shambles. So he got to make them, he, he got to make random people suffer. Like, You're going to hear about three kids who were standing al along with a bunch of others along the curb in front of Steaming Cup. And as the defendant swerved from the left side of the street as he hit Jane back to the right side of the street as he was avoiding the vehicle that was ahead of him, clipped the curb and hit these three kids. Then we're going to move in to the next group in the parade route, which is the dancing grannies. This is the deadliest point in the parade. Seven people in this group were struck. Four of them died. You're going to hear from witnesses, uh, members of the Dancing Grannies group, who will come in and they will describe being completely caught off guard. They will describe seeing pom-poms in the air. And the next thing they knew, there were bodies on the ground before the pom-poms hit the ground. You will learn about Bill Hospital who was walk marching in a support capacity. He was there to support his wife Lola and their friends, the rest of the dancing grannies, just walking along the parade route trying to be helpful. I'm not even trying to act like he up there praying. The dancing grannies vehicle, which is a white SUV, you'll see it in the vid video, swerved around the right side. Hands down, bro. He hits Bill. And the medical examiner is going to tell you that Bill Hospital cause of death was multiple blunt force traumatic injuries. You'll learn about Tamara Durand, marching with the grannies. This is her first parade. You'll see a diagram of where she was positioned. You'll see video of her getting struck. The medical examiner will tell you that Tamara Durand, cause of death, multiple blunt force traumatic injuries. You'll hear about Lee Owen, another dancing granny, positioned right next to Lee, excuse me, right next to Tamara, who had just begun one of her favorite routines, walking in a winter wonderland, and she got hit. You'll learn about Jenny Sorensen. You'll learn that Jenny was walking at the front of the group carrying the banner. You'll learn that Jenny was normally a coach for the group. Normally she rode in the vehicle in the back so that she could provide feedback and critique to her dance mates. But she filled in at the last moment today to help carry the banner. That's the video of Jenny being struck. Wow, man. The medical examiner will tell you that Jenny Sorensen's cause of death was multiple blunt force traumatic injuries. <laughs> She filled in at the last moment, which means that she didn't even really plan to be there. It was just a spur of the moment thing. So she probably told her family that day, I'll, I'll just go ahead and go over here, you know, show support to the team. And then she lost her life doing that. She lost her life just looking out for me. That's just wild, bro. You'll hear... More speed analysis, test analysis testimony at this point. You're going to hear from Mike Smith with the Wisconsin State Patrol. He's going to testify very similarly to how Detective Carpenter is going to testify about speed analysis. And her family Basically, probably feels like they wish video. they could have told her just, insurance, which is on the south side of just the stay here with us instead. The granny's getting struck. And look what and measure point to point and <coughs> measure the time between those two points and calculate an average speed over that distance, which is roughly from... Clinton Street up until the camera cuts out. He'll tell you that at that point where the defendant crashed through the Dancing Grannies group, he was traveling at approximately 32 miles an hour. The eighth and final group that was 
struck by the defendant in this case is the Catholic Communities of Waukesha. This is a faith-based organization that consists of members of multiple local Catholic churches who got together that Sunday afternoon to spread a little Christmas cheer. There is not great video, and perhaps that's for the best, of this group getting struck. In total, there were 19 victims in this group. In what little you can see from the video, you can see the defendant's taillights swerving from the left side of the street to the right. You can see them bouncing up and down. There are no speed bumps in that section of the road. The next phase of the evidence will involve uh, the manhunt. How authorities found the defendant, took him into custody, and the statements he made after he was placed under arrest. You will hear from Officer Bryce Skolton, who was positioned, if you look at this third of the three maps I referenced, uh, on the very top of this map, at the intersection of Main Street and Wisconsin. Officer Skolton was positioned at that point to direct the parade route to make a left-hand turn from Main Street onto Wisconsin, to stop any traffic coming from the other directions. He saw the defendant come around that corner. He saw the defendant drive right at him as he's standing in the middle of the road. And as the defendant went around him to the left, and went south, Officer Skolton fired three rounds from his service weapon. All three rounds hit the car, none of them hit the defendant. You will hear from uh, another police officer who was not on duty that day, he just happens to be a police officer. His name is Officer Ralph Salyers. He's from the Wauwatosa Police Department. If you take a look at that map, he's gonna describe to you being uh, on the sidewalk, leaving the parade, he was walking past Les Paul Middle School. He's going to describe hearing a loud commotion. He's going to describe <coughs> seeing a red SUV with just utterly total front end damage coming to rest uh, in a driveway at 338 Maple Avenue. You're going to see video of the defendant in the red SUV pulling into the alley behind 338 Maple and then a few moments later, you'll see what appears to be the defendant coming back onto the screen and running away from the vehicle, apparently in a hurry, apparently aware that he had done something terribly wrong. You're going to hear from a series of witnesses between that point and the defendant's arrest where they will describe the defendant approaching them, contacting them, asking them to use their phone. Because he was in such a rush when he ditched his SUV, he left his phones behind. Then you're going to hear from Daniel Ryder, and I think the evidence will show Daniel Ryder really is a good embodiment of the spirit of Waukesha. Not knowing what Mr. Brooks had done, Daniel Ryder opened his home to the defendant. The defendant showed up at his front door without any shoes on, with a t-shirt, said he was cold, said he needed to use the phone. Daniel Ryder let him inside. Gave him a sandwich. Wow. Him use the phone, and then gave him a coat. And a few minutes later, the police showed up. You're going to see body cam video of that arrest. You're going to hear from Officer Rebecca Carpenter that she responded to that area around where Daniel Ryder lives because of reports of a man knocking on doors. She takes him into custody. He identifies himself on the body cam video. They search him, and in his pocket they find a red, excuse me, a key to the red Ford Escape used in this attack. You're going to hear from a series of officers who retraced the defendant's steps that night, recovered surveillance video showing the path that he took, the path that's depicted here in the third map that I'm showing you. You're going to hear how they recovered his sandal, his sweatshirt, along the, the escape route. You're going to hear from Detective Jay Carpenter with the City of Waukesha Police Department, and he's going to talk to you about the defendant's statements after he was taken into custody. I'm going to let that interview speak for itself, 
other than pointing out for you that you will, I think, quickly learn a few main points about the defendant on the night that this happened. He was lucid. He was aware. He was intelligent. He was probing for information. And he was deceptive. We're going to then wrap up with testimony from people who plugged any of the remaining holes in the investigation. You'll hear from crime lab analysts about DNA evidence, about finding the defendant's DNA on the steering wheel of the Red Ford Escape. You're going to hear from Wisconsin. For him to, to like at any point say he never meant to do this would be the dumbest thing to ever hear. Like, why would you? Because first of all, if he didn't mean to do it, then why did he run, right? Like he, they said uh, after it came to rest in the alleyway, if it was really something he didn't mean to do, he, <clears throat> excuse me, he would have got out of his car, called the police, and uh, explained to him how, you know, the vehicle malfunctioned or something like that. So him saying he didn't mean to do something, State I don't control, even know what Inspector kind of stupid Ryan stuff Schultz you're trying to convince people of, bro. You need to about just... the mechanical inspection that he did on this vehicle. In case you were wondering... It is sick that he's even trying to, like, get out of... Like, that would have prevented Mr. Brooks from stopping or from pulling over. He's going to quickly put those... Bro, blind man, together. see you meant to do this. He conducted that mechanical inspection. No problem with the brakes. The accelerator didn't stick. There were no mechanical problems that would have prevented Mr. Brooks from stopping. See? Finally, we're going to close our presentation of the evidence, not with a witness, but with an experience for you. You are going to go to a secure location, and you're going to have a chance to see the murder weapon with your own eyes. You'll be able to see that red Ford escape. That's wild. I want to close now with a few points about how the evidence relates to the law. So they actually case. brought the SUV there, are, there somewhere. Obviously, we've gone through the six counts of first-degree intentional homicide. But in addition to those homicide counts, there are six counts of hit-and-run involving death. Those are separate charges. The evidence will support convictions on all of them, all 12 counts of homicide. But they involve the same six victims. Another point I want to bring to your attention is that for each count of first-degree intentional homicide and each count of first degree recklessly endangering safety, if you find the defendant guilty of any of those counts, you have to answer a second question. Did he commit that crime while using a dangerous weapon? And here the evidence will wow, show that he didn't bro, use a gun or a knife. I just, looked up a, I just looked up a picture. I don't know if y'all can see it. That's the SUV right there. That's... Crazy, 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 crazy. 3,500 pounds of steel, rubber, and glass. A lot of this stuff you can't even put into words. Like, it's some stuff in this world. The defendant's also charged with two counts of felony bail jumping. You'll hear so evidence like, uh, to support those charges, which includes the fact that the defendant was charged beneath with the felony human, I don't even know how to say I don't even know how to say what I'm trying to say. Custody, stuff that's so dark, you really can't put it into words. But, like, that's really it. Offense in a separate case in Milwaukee County and released from custody subject to conditions of bail. And those conditions of bail included requirements Let me erase this dude off of my history because I don't even like him being and on my internet of bail history. Were in effect on November 21st. Like when I don't react to this, I try not to like look at anything about Daryl Brooks. We have dozens of I don't even want video clips to, to show you. Thing to do You're gonna it. have notebooks and writing utensils while we present this evidence to you. It's a lot to keep track of. And when you go back into the deliberation room, it might be difficult while you're deliberating to remember which video was about which victim or which incident or which group. And so my suggestion to you is that as we go through these videos, you're free to do whatever you want with your notes, but my suggestion would be as we go through these videos, they each will be labeled with an exhibit number. And so I recommend that you keep track of which exhibit number corresponds with which video. That way, while you're deliberating, if you want to see those videos again, you can ask for them by exhibit number. Can't guarantee that you'll be able to see any or all of them, but you can ask. 
I'm done now. I want to close on one final point, and that is on behalf of the state of Wisconsin, I want to say thank you. We work your serving in what is the greatest criminal justice system in the history of the world, and that's because of the 16 of you. It's because a group of citizens, randomly selected, come in and make the final, ultimate determination between guilty and not guilty. That's unique in this world. It's special. And so we're going to go through this evidence. We're going to be mindful of your time. We know how valuable it is. We're going to be efficient, but we have a lot to get through. A lot. And at the conclusion of all that evidence, District Attorney Opper is going to stand up here and she's going to ask you to render verdicts consistent with the evidence, to find the defendant guilty of each and every count. Thank you. Wonderfully said. Yet again, about a prosecution. And I wanted to Mr. say too, I- My first question to you is, um, will you be making an opening statement at this point or deferring until your case, meaning the defense portion of the case? Uh, I will be deferring at this time, Your Honor. I need uh, a little more adequate time to make sure I go over the points that I need to make. All right, then the court will uh, honor that request, advise the jury he's deferring his opening statement until a later point in the proceedings. Okay. Um, I am gonna just. So I guess deferring means putting whatever it is he wants to say on hold until a different time during the trial. I'm learning stuff during this because I don't know a lot of legal terms. I mean, y'all know at this point pretty much, but like, Take you know, a short I'm learning a good bit from this. Some logistics with the parties to determine whether it makes sense to start with a witness tonight yet. It's four o'clock, a little bit after, or wait until tomorrow. So either way, you'll come back because uh, you'll either hear testimony or I'll read an instruction for you. But at this point, uh, the jury may be excused. And I wanted to say real quick, I know his name is Darrell. I, I call him Daryl anyway, because I don't, I don't care. Don't care one bit. Attorney Upper, uh, your first witness, how long would that witness be? Our first witness is Sergeant Warner. Uh, I expect his testimony to take 10 to 15 minutes on direct. I would ask that you would hear his testimony this evening, or this afternoon, Your Honor. He was supposed to have left town at about noon today to take his daughter on a college visit in Kentucky. He's delayed his departure so he could provide his testimony. And uh, if we can get him in and out, he will leave at five o'clock and arrive at midnight at his destination. I have a second witness, if the court would hear me, um, who's here as well. Her testimony probably would also take about 15 minutes on direct. Maybe a little longer? No? Mr. Mitchell says no. Um, she has traveled here from Janesville. Her transportation is also difficult. Um, and so she's here and ready to go if the court would indulge those two witnesses this afternoon. It certainly seems reasonable. Mr. Brooks, my question to you then is, do you want to come back over for uh, the testimony of those witnesses to um, I'm still kind of taken aback by not being able to um, to know exactly how many witnesses are expected to testify and not being able to um, turn in my own witness list well mr. Brooks the you've been given copies of the witness list the states offered you a flash drive with all of the exhibits to streamline what will be presented at trial versus what is in discovery. So you've had ample opportunity to review those. Um, I'm happy to bring you uh, back. Um, I need you to pledge to me that you will follow the uh, rules of procedure and evidence, uh, that you will only uh, interrupt if you have an objection. Um, that objection needs to be founded in law 
and then you need to pledge to me that you will honor whatever decision I make so that the testimony of these individuals can proceed uh, within the time frame that the prosecution has indicated it will take. You, of course, will have an opportunity to cross-examine them. Um, are you willing to follow the rules of courtesy and decorum and the rules of procedure and evidence? Of course not. Uh, from what you explained yesterday, the objections you said have to be like that's not what she like asked you. Words, the, the, the way to actually object. So I don't well, recall you. I can give you up to a sentence. I'm, I'm, what I am trying to avoid, sir, are what are called speaking objections. Uh, the idea behind that is that you give me just a little bit of information so that I can either make a determination or, if appropriate, uh, send the jury back out so that I can then hear arguments from the parties. Uh, some objections really are one word, hearsay, maybe three words, calls for speculation, um, things of that nature. So um, if you're willing to abide by that procedure, then you can come back to this courtroom. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't really... It's a yes or no. Okay, stay in there then. Cut them off. Let's keep so you're it going. not willing to follow the rules of courtesy and decorum and procedure and evidence? That's, that's not what I said. That's why I'm asking the clarification question, sir. Um, I, I was clear in what I said. I don't think uh, I can make that determination right now. Let me ask it this way, sir. You may reclaim your right to be present if you are willing to conduct yourself that even consistently mean? with the decorum and respect inherent in what what else do you have to do right now you got another appointment to be somewhere else or something what do you mean you can't answer it right now what else is going on that's keeping you from providing either a three word answer or i said three word either a three letter answer or a two letter answer what what is it that's keeping you from doing that courts and judicial proceedings are you able to do that sir Yes or no? Uh, I thought I have. Sir, it's a, I think, a fairly simple question. I'm asking you um, if you are willing to, to conduct yourself appropriately. And he thinks I'm he's being slick that, right are now. Are you willing to conduct yourself appropriately, sir? I have to the best of my ability. Sir, please answer my question directly. Are you willing to conduct yourself appropriately? I have direct, uh, conducted myself appropriately. I'm not asking about your past behavior. I'm asking if you're willing from this point forward for the purposes of the testimony of two witnesses to conduct yourself appropriately. Have. If that's, that's what he question. called. That's not the answer I'm looking for. I'm not asking if you have. I'm asking if you're willing going forward to conduct yourself appropriately during the questioning of these two witnesses. Yes or no? I mean, if that's what he calls conducting himself appropriately, I don't know what's. Uh... I'm going to end up getting put back over here eventually. Okay, so at least he knows. At least he knows. Mr. Brooks, I'm. Further advising you, I'm looking for a direct answer of yes or no, and that your failure to give me a yes or no answer will be considered by this court to be non-responsive. So let me ask you the question one more time. Are you willing to conduct I mean, yourself he probably just want to stay over there. during the questioning of these two witnesses? And I want them to stay over there. To be 100% honest, I cannot answer that. All right. All right, then based on that answer, which is non-responsive to the question that I asked, he has not given me uh, a pledge or indication of a willingness to conduct himself appropriately going forward, and based on that, he'll remain where he is. You will remain unmuted, and so if you have an objection, you can... Uh, I'm so happy about that. Lodge that I'm objection. I'm so happy. Keep him over there. 
within accordance. What sucks is I know eventually they're gonna bring them back because, like, I, you know, we've seen footage of them right, back in there. So. Heavy, uh, oh, man, I wish he could just stay in, in that little room. Keep him in his little uh, timeout box. Somebody said in the comment, <laughs> put him, put him in timeout. Let's um. Responsive. You did not answer yes or no. But I answered the question. Um, do I need? To, oh, I wanted to see if the camera I don't consent angle. to non-responsive. So have them wait for a sec, please. Sorry. Are you making a judicial determination that I was non-responsive? I'm not going to answer any other questions at this point. The state's setting up a map for use with a witness. I want to make sure that it's something that is viewable on the witness camera that is being uh, transmitted into the courtroom where you are seated. So let me back up. He taking full advantage of the I fact that she leaving him it. unmuted. Please tell me if you think that accurately depicts what I'm gonna go over on that map. Do I need to back out a little bit? Yeah, that boy is <laughs> he permanently leaning forward, scanning the screen for opportunities to interrupt. Look at this. There it is. I can think with where that chair is, the witness will. Oh, that would be a good idea. No, you're not muted yet. Mr. Brooks, Yo, I'm, asking you to make a judicial I'm telling you, I have not seen this yet. I didn't know he was actually going to say, was that a judicial determination? That's crazy. I had no idea he was going to say that. I mean, it's obvious what he's going to say, pretty much. Thank you, sir. Now we're moving on to that part of the procedure. Since you are, you know, you're not following uh, the protocol that I've set in place, that you are back to one of these sovereign tactics about have I made a judicial determination? The record speaks for itself, sir. Um, I'm not going to um, make a further record on that, nor will I answer the question about. Am I making a judicial determination? I've made a decision, and that decision is you will remain in the other courtroom. Um, once the jury is brought back in, I will unmute so that you can lodge objections, but if you interrupt without making an objection and just start talking or start talking about a judicial determination, then I'm gonna mute you once again and the procedure for objecting will require that you raise your sign, uh, write it out, and provide it to the uh, bailiff who will provide it to the court so that I can rule on it. And I'm hoping that uh, he forfeits his right to like do a cross-examination. I hope this. I hope he doesn't even get the opportunity to do it. You know, it, I want the least amount of time. Um, for him to even be talking, because as soon as he opens his mouth and starts talking, I, it's a media that frustration. That things down, then so be it. But um, that's the procedure that I'm going to follow. All right. The Everybody in the room room is frustrated when Daryl opens his mouth and starts talking. I'm just like, mm. as a reminder, we um, keep him in his little not cubby. Firing and all rise even for the jurors. I, I understand you may do it, but I'm. There's a reason why I'm not requiring it, so. Mike, will Pete have the notebook? Oh, excellent, thank you. You can start passing them out.
Ladies and gentlemen, you may have a seat. And the writing materials will be passed out. Our intent is to call, have the state call its first two witnesses. Um, and then once that is done, I have uh, an instruction to read and then we'll break for the day. And uh, I'll consult with the parties before I let you know what time we should report tomorrow. And keep in mind my time I say we start for court might be different than your report time. All right, all the materials passed out? Very well, then the state may call its first witness. Thank you, Judge. State call Sergeant Dave Warner. Good afternoon, Sergeant. Right, if you would please make your way up. to the witness stand. When you get there, please remain standing. Raise your right hand and my clerk, Teresa, will swear you in. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you, sir. Please have a seat, at least initially, or do you want him to stay standing? No, actually, we'll, you can start out uh, seated, please. Very well. Sir, would you please state your first and last names for the record and spell each? Yes. Uh, my name is Sergeant David, D-A-V-I-D, Warner, W-A-N-N-E-R. Thank you. Go ahead, Attorney Opper, your witness. Thank you. Uh, sir, how are you employed? I'm a patrol sergeant with the City of Waukesha Police Department. How long have you worked in law enforcement? 18 years. And wow. uh, as patrol sergeant, what are your general duties and responsibilities? I oversee officers uh, across all shifts uh, that are assigned to the patrol division. I want to direct your attention to the date of November 21, 2021. Did you work that day? Yes. Were there any events occurring in the city of Waukesha that afternoon? The Waukesha Christmas Parade was that afternoon. Has the Christmas Parade uh, been held in years prior to, uh, excuse me, prior to 2021? Yes, every year that I've been employed at the police department, we've had a Christmas Parade. And uh, is it typically that third week in November before Thanksgiving? Yes, every year that I can remember it has been. Okay. Is there any planning or preparation that goes into uh, holding a parade in Waukesha? Yes, there are meetings with the uh, uh, group that's putting on the parade in advance. Um, there's also uh, a group of individuals that prior to the parade, usually the Friday before, will post no parking signs along the parade route. Uh, there's a, a group from our, um, our city garage or Department of Public Works that will put out barricades at the designated intersections uh, where we request them to put them out. And what about uh, manpower? What type of manpower would you devote to uh, an event like this, sir? Uh, it's rather significant uh, given the um, a large area that a parade like this uh, encompasses the estimated uh, amount of attendance at the parade um, between detectives, police officers, supervisors, reserve officers, community service officers. Uh, I would say we have in excess of, of 30 additional bodies uh, planned that day just to handle the parade itself. You mentioned um, the use of uh, individuals such as reserve officers and community service officers, I think you said, is that correct? Yes. Are those sworn law enforcement officers? They are not sworn, no. What is their role or function? Uh, the reserve officer group is a, a group of people who volunteer their time to help with um, events like parades. Um, they're given training in directing traffic and closing streets down. Um, a community service officer is a, a paid position. They're part-time employees, um, usually younger um, individuals um, learning to, or looking to learn more about a career in law enforcement. And you said uh, also parking attendants would be assisting in this endeavor? Correct. We usually, we're, we're usually looking to get as many extra bodies as we can, and the, um, the assistance from our parking agents is usually required for this event as well. And this would be in addition to the sworn law enforcement officers that are assigned to work the parade? Correct. And obviously you still need other officers to patrol the city, correct? Yes. Where is the parade held? Uh, it, uh, the, the parade takes up a large portion of our downtown area. 
there's a staging area that uh, the floats before the parade that they're all instructed to assemble in a particular area along White Rock Avenue uh, between Niagara Street and Main Street. And that's about a three hour process of getting all the parade, par parade participants into that area and, and lined up accordingly. Um, the parade itself uh, runs along Main Street um, from White Rock westbound uh, to the Veterans Park area um, where it makes a turn and then heads up Wisconsin Avenue and ends near the Waukesha Public Library. Sir, if I could ask you to stand up and refer to the uh, diagram behind you. This is a map that's been marked as State's Exhibit Number 1. Do you see that sticker in the bottom right-hand corner? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry, it's a little tight up there. Sorry. But um, if you could start in the upper right-hand corner of the map, and uh, you're on a, if we put up the digital copy of the map as well, I know it's hard to see, but then we'd have to do the screen share again. Is that correct? Yes, that's my understanding. Okay, I'm gonna ask uh, the paralegal to please put up state's exhibit number one on the digital copy as well. I feel like I should low key be taking notes on some of this stuff. Wonder if Daryl is going to claim he can't hear any of this. All right, Madam Clerk, thank you. We're ready here. As you present that, you know you can hit that little arrow on the E app and get rid of those extra things that aren't needed. There you go. Go ahead. All right, and um, Ms. Gussie, if you could. Zoom in on the upper right hand corner, please. There you go. All right, sir, if you, you can um, use the map, the big map in front of you, please, and the jury can follow along with the digital copy if they want. Um, so starting in the upper right hand corner. Yes. What's up there, please? That is Frame Park. And uh, is there, what's at Frame Park? Uh, Frame Park has a lot of, uh, it's got a playground for children, there's a very large baseball diamond, um, different shelters, there's a formal garden, there's a boat launch. Um, it's a very large park in our, in our city that encompasses a lot of different activities. Is the boat launch shown on Exhibit 1? Yes, right here. Okay. And uh, the waterway that's shown on the uh, exhibit, what is that waterway? That is the Fox River. Now, is the parade route shown on uh, Exhibit 1? Sir, if we have a few one second, Mr. Brooks, just a reminder, you're not muted. Oh. All right, I'm sorry for the interruption. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, too. I, I thought I was muted. I apologize. That's okay. Thank you so much. Go ahead and point out the parade route, please. So the parade route <laughs> on this map doing? is... I ain't even hear him talking. This, That's this surprising. Uh, this area here something. is the, what I referred to earlier as a staging area. And then actually at this corner right here, um, westbound is where the parade route. Real quick, sorry if you guys hear like music and stuff. It's somebody in the parking lot just blasting music. Just wanted to say that real quick. Somebody in the parking lot the outside of my apartment. To this is Veterans Park. That's that area there. And then it would turn up Wisconsin Avenue and end around the, the library right here, which is that green area. Okay, and we're just putting that up on the digital display too right now. Now, on this uh, map, sir, uh, we've designated uh, several points along the parade route to reflect where various officers were positioned. Is that correct? Yes. And could you just briefly walk us through it? I don't need you to name every officer, but oh, just point no, out I the see. intersections okay. and what was... Okay, I was a bit confused by this. Okay, so now... 
because I remember she said where the badges are represent something, but now I see these are the actual officers and their names and like their status, I guess. Okay. It's located at each intersection using exhibit one. Sure. Um, I was here at uh, the intersection of Hartwell and White Rock. I had a police uh, SUV, an unmarked police vehicle, um, trying to maintain the integrity of the route and keeping the road shut down. Um, here we had various officers. It's kind of a mixed use of barricades, marked police vehicles, police tape, um, just in, a, in an order to, to keep the streets shut down and make sure that there's a visible representation that the streets are not open. Um, Please keep going down uh, westbound down Main Street, please. Sure. Um, so we come to Buckley and East Avenue here. Uh, both sides of the intersection shut down with barricades. Uh, we come down further on West Main Street to Martin Street. Uh, the red line here signifies a barricade was in place there. Uh, Main Street and North Barstow Street. Uh, again, barricades on both sides of the intersection there. Um, uh, Gaspar and East Main Street, um, a barricade. We also had a, a marked police fleet as we did at other places where the yellow is signifying that. Um, this is our five points area, as we call it, uh, kind of a, a larger intersection with roads um, in different directions here. So at this intersection, we had a use of barricades, police tape, police vehicles. Uh, it's just a very large intersection to be able to shut down just with one of those things so it kind of becomes a mixed use of different tools that are available to us uh, we have clinton street and, and main street here um, again barricades on both sides of the intersections uh, along with officers maple avenue and east main street uh, barricades and reserve officers and then we come around toward the Veterans Park area. Again, another very large intersection um, where we had um, an officer and uh, multiple barricades um, shutting off the traffic. And then along Wisconsin Avenue here, um, we had one point at Maple Avenue uh, where we had um, a CSO along with a barricade. And right now you're pointing at the very bottom edge of the map, correct? The very bottom here. Um, and then from that point east, the parade kind of disassembles with floats going different ways depending upon their size and the maneuverability at the end of the parade route. This map exhibit number one is oriented north, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, the items, and I know this is like a vision test for everybody, but uh, on the map, the yellow boxes represent what, please? Uh, the yellow boxes on this map represent uh, police vehicles that were utilized in the parade. Okay, and what about the blue boxes? The blue boxes are the names of personnel assigned. Uh, where you see an RO, that would be a reserve officer. PA would be a parking <coughs> agent. Um, CSO would be our community service officer. Um, OFC would be an officer. All right. The the reserve officers and non-sworn officers, would they be wearing a police uniform or some type of designation? Yes, they all have. Um, Hold on, there's an objection. Uh, it's overruled, he may answer. All personnel on the parade route are in uniforms. Um, additionally, everyone, it's, it's part of our policy that they are required to wear uh, traffic vests, um, which would have been uh, uh, yellow and uh, could have been a blue and yellow or orange and yellow traffic vest that says police on it. Okay. I'd like to um, go back to the area on White Rock where you were located, where the um, units were staging, correct? Yes. Now, can you um, describe for us where the road was actually shut off by police so that no motorists could actually travel down the road? Sure. I mean, this... Uh Actually, further north than here, it's off the map, um, is where we had our first point of shutdown. It was at White Rock Avenue and Niagara Street. Uh, we used Niagara Street to divert any traffic that um, would have come that direction. Um, so then along here, there would have been a shutdown at Niagara. There was another street called Perkins uh, where it was shut down. And then um, right here is Baxter Street. 
where we had the street shut down. Uh, additionally, here along the staging route, uh, North Hartwell Avenue here was shut down on, on both sides of it um, to ensure no traffic entered into the staging area while that space was occupied. All right, and before I have you sit down, there's two other des uh, areas designated on the map I'd like to ask you about. This is on the left uh, upper left quadrant of the map. On the north side of the Fox River, uh, there's something indicated as the Barstow Hill. Do you see that on the map, sir? Yeah, it's right here by the green line. What's the Barstow Hill? Uh, the Barstow Hill is just a, a very steep hill um, that more or less connects our downtown to a, a neighborhood and, and is a going from the downtown area. Okay, that's Barstow Road there? Correct. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, just to the right of that, there's something marked as a mobile gas station, is that correct? Yes. Objection. Uh, overruled. And uh, there is a gas station at that intersection, sir? Yes, there is a mobile gas station at the bottom of the Barstow Hill. Okay. All right, uh, please have a seat, sir. We're sending officers out to their locations along the route here. At 1 p.m. is when the initial uh, few officers head out um, to secure the staging area. Um, so they're out there from 1 o'clock until about 3.30. Uh, between 3 and 3.30 is when the rest of the um, personnel assigned to the parade would have arrived at their locations along the route. All right. And I assume you're in some... Your Honor, we just lost part of the polycom. Well, we'll pause. It won't happen otherwise. And we can take that down for now. Um, we don't need the state table display at the moment. Mr. Brooks, uh, we lost you for a second. We, as soon as we knew it was down, it, uh, we stopped. We didn't take any additional testimony. I just want to confirm you can see and hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. And you can see the four cameras, so the witness as well? Yeah. All right, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so... I'm surprised he um, gave a straightforward answer, to be honest. I thought he was going to play around. There's somebody that's running the parade as far as lining up the participants and, and uh, making sure everybody that's uh, walking in the parade is where they're supposed to be, correct? Correct. Is there a title for that person? Boy, I wouldn't know I... Well, your objection is noted, it's overruled. He may testify about the question asked. Or is there somebody that you were dealing I'm glad they're discussing this though, and the way the barricades are set up and everything, like. It it kind of, um, or not kind of, but it shows that there was no, like, mistake in terms of him, like, being unaware that he was, um, going through the area where the parade was. So I'm really glad that they're going, like, they're reviewing the map, they're reviewing where the barricades are set up and everything, just so it eliminates that as well. Like, Maybe every single directly. thing that... That was kind of responsible he could possibly for the of the parade and you're raised to say like, oh, this is what was really yes, going there on. Yes, there was a... They're just taking it off the table. Overruled, you may answer. There is a lady from the Good Chamber stuff from of the Commerce prosecution. who put on the parade um, that just prior to the parade starting, I had a face-to-face -face contact with to inform her that um, the route was ready for the parade. Now, how do you know that? How do you know that the route was ready to go? Um, between... Um, 3.30 and 4 o'clock, I had driven the route several times uh, within the parade route on the street that was shut down. Uh, it was my duty as the incident commander of the parade to make sure that the um, officers or personnel assigned to the parade were all in their location, that all the barricades were in place, uh, that there was no holes in the parade route that we missed um, in the planning, and as a, a final security sweep of, of the route just to ensure everything was in place as we had planned for it to be. Can you estimate how many spectators were present? Objection. At what time? Oh, I'm sorry, at the start of the parade. Thousands. Um, 
I once the parade had started, I was not on the route anymore. Um, you know, I think the last time I drove the route itself would have been just before four o'clock is my final lap through. Okay. And there's spectators on both sides of the road, north and south sides of Main Street? Correct. And all the way from uh, Hartwell, all the way down to Veterans Park at the end there near Wisconsin Avenue? Yes, I'd say the majority of the... Oh, hold on, it's an objection. Go ahead, what's your objection? Uh, that is hearsay. We, how, we, we can't know um, sure where everybody was at. The objection is noted. It is overruled based upon the foundation previously laid by the witness. Go ahead. The spectators are primarily um, from the intersection of White Rock and Main Street westbound. So you were satisfied it was uh, appropriate appropriately safe to start the parade is that right sir yes what did you do i had face-to-face -face contact with the organizer of the parade um, i indicated to her that i i checked the route and uh, from the police side of things that we were ready for the parade to proceed and um, let her know that she could begin whenever she was ready about what time of day was that it was right about 4 p.m and uh you had mentioned the units were staging on White Rock near where you were posted, is that right? Yes. And did you see um, as the units would enter the parade route, then they all kind of move forward, I'm assuming? Yes, the... Um, overruled. The parade participants are, are set up on either side of White Rock Avenue, um, and they're kind of funneled together into almost a zipper type fashion uh, as they enter the parade route. And as um, they march forward towards the parade route then, at some point, is the road behind them vacant? Correct. And what do you do when that happens? We try to cause as little disruption in the city, um, shutting down White Rock Avenue. It's a, a very major thoroughfare in the city and having it shut down for that extended period of time causes some pretty significant traffic problems. So as the road is no longer occupied by um, parade participants, we try to open up the road um, from behind them, keeping the back of the parade shut down, um, always taking into account um, you know, a, a street for a car to turn off onto. So. Did you remain in that same position near um, White Rock and Hartwell? Yes. And uh, do you remember um, how you had your squad positioned? Objection as you're saying. Um, overruled. I had my squad positioned across White Rock Avenue in an east-west fashion. Um, I essentially that objection in the middle sense. of the roadway. The road is much wider than um, the SUV squad I was driving is. Um, I positioned it that way to give a visual um, representation to motorists that the road wasn't open. And is your squad marked or unmarked? It is unmarked. Objection irrelevant. Um, it's relevant. The answer may stand. Make sure if you hear an objection, sir, that you wait until I rule on it too. Thank you. Are there red and blue lights on your squad car, sir? Yes. Objection irrelevant. Overruled, the answer may stand. Did you have your red and blue lights activated as it was parked across the roadway? Objection, irrelevant. Overruled. Yes. Here we go. Remember hearing Must have got something a second win. about a disturbance? Uh, now he's ready to go off. Watch. Yes. Objection, hearsay. Um, are you offering it's it for the foundational, Your Honor? All right, it's not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. The objection is overruled. He may answer. I believe he answered yes, and it may stand. All right. Um, what do you remember hearing about an incident at the boat launch? Uh, when I was at near my position on, on Hartwell and White Rock, I was speaking with one of our reserve officers. Uh, we were discussing the proper opening timing of the opening of the road. Um, and I, I overheard actually on his police radio that he was wearing um, squads that were not assigned to the parade being sent uh, to a fight uh, at Frame Park that involved knives. 
Were you aware of any vehicles being associated with that fight? Objection, irrelevant. Overruled, you may answer. So I didn't they were referring to Daryl. Associated. What do you remember next? This is a violent dude. Bro. I remember seeing Night the hearing squad responding to this, um, this fight at Frame Park. Um, and at that time, uh, we were still focused on opening up the roadway and I made my way back toward my, my unmarked police vehicle and I looked to my right or to the north down White Rock Avenue and I saw a, a red SUV um, traveling toward me at a high rate of speed. What do you mean by a high rate of speed, sir? Objection, that's hearsay. Overruled, he may answer. I believe the vehicle is traveling in excess of 40 miles per hour. What's the posted speed limit there on White Rock Avenue? It's a 25 mile per hour zone. What about Main Street in downtown Waukesha? What's the posted speed limit there, sir? The speed limit is relevant. Overruled, it's relevant. The speed limit throughout the parade route is 25 miles per hour. What did you do when you saw this uh, red SUV traveling at a high rate of speed? Objection, leading the witness. Uh, uh, the objection is noted, it's overruled. When I saw the red SUV traveling toward me at a high rate of speed, um, I used both hands and waved them overhead like this uh, in an attempt to catch the attention of the driver. Were you dressed in a police uniform, sir? Yes. And yeah. just put on the record when the witness, so that's clear, uh, placed both hands over his head in what I would describe as a waving kind of back and forth at a diagonal um, uh, gesture. Thank you, go ahead. Did the car continue in your direction, or the SUV? Yes, it did. What did you observe the path of travel for the SUV to be? Objection, that's hearsay. Mr. Brooks, it's not hearsay. Your objection is overruled. Can we answer? <laughs> Could you say the question sense. one more time? Sure, where did you see the SUV go? Better question. Objection, irrelevant. Overruled. The SUV entered the parade route. I want you to describe what you remember seeing as it passed your location, please. Uh, as I was waving my hands overhead, I was approximately six feet um, from where the SUV was driving. Um, as, the, as the driver passed, uh, essentially in front of me by about six feet, um, I could see the operator of the vehicle in a, uh, just a, a dazed, straight focus look straight ahead um, not looking at anyone did the driver appear to respond to your efforts to stop the vehicle there is absolutely no response did the uh did you notice the car slow down in any fashion no in fact it's not hearsay it's, not hearsay. it's overruled he may answer as the suv passed me um i looked over the the hood of or the top of the police vehicle that I had positioned on the road there, fully expecting that as it passed that the, I would see the car slam on its brakes as it realized it had entered the parade route, um, figuring it was a lost motorist. Um, I didn't see that happen. Um, it continued um, into the parade route at a, a high rate of speed. What did you do? Uh, upon seeing that, I got on my radio uh, in an attempt to notify other personnel assigned to the parade route. Uh, I, I stated that a red SUV had just blown by me. Do you remember using those exact words, sir? Objection, that's irrelevant. Overruled, you may answer. I don't know if I said a red or maroon SUV, but I remember saying that it had blown by me. Were there um, parade units still on White Rock attempting to get onto the parade route at that point? Yes. Objection. Were you able to see the vehicle clearly as it went? I'm sorry. He objected, it's overruled. Go ahead. From where you were standing there, were you able to turn and watch the SUV as it traveled past you down White Rock towards Main Street? Objection. Overruled. Just asked that. 
He ain't even I only watched yet. it for a, a short period of time before returning to my squad car, um, knowing that some sort of police action was going to need to be taken. What did you do once you got to your squad? Uh, I got in my squad car. Um, it was bombarded with um, the most terrible... Um, That's wild, man. You know it hurts this dude a lot because he's... He dedicated his whole life to serving and protecting this city, and then this happened. It's like I told you, this stuff hurts so many people. Like, you can't even really put it into uh, some heavy stuff. <clears throat> it's the most terrible thing I ever heard. The sounds. Yes. You didn't see anything at that point as far as people getting hit? No. Okay. I want to show you a video clip, sir. This is State's Exhibit Number 2. Madam Clerk, if you could please turn on the State's table. It's crazy. Shout out to all the officers out there, man, serving and protecting. I'll show it to you first. So, Sergeant Wander, you know, if you look at the screen, this in front dude of dedicated you, everything to helping the city, and then I can't imagine what he's feeling also. Before we show it to the jury, probably feeling a lot, okay. a lot of guilt and everything. Did you see that clip, sir? Yes. Is that uh, a video clip you've seen before? I have seen that, yes. Okay. Do you believe that's a true and accurate representation of the SUV traveling um, near White, I'm sorry, on White Rock <coughs> Avenue near the start of the parade at Main Street? Yes. Move uh, for admission and permission to publish, Your Honor. <clears throat> Any objection, Mr. Brooks? Uh, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. The state just moved admission of Exhibit 2. She just expected, expects him to object at this uh, point. I'm uh, surprised. I object to that. Keep it. All right. Um, the objection's noted. It's overruled. Exhibit 2, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> the jury is received. Permission to publish is granted. Go ahead, toss your little objection out so I can, so I can smack it down. Uh, please hit pretty play. Much. Sergeant Wanner, is that uh, consistent with the vehicle you saw um, traveling away from you past the parade floats that were about to enter the route? Yes. And is that consistent with the approximate speed you saw it traveling? Yes. After you became aware that something terrible was happening on the parade route, your incident commander, what do you do? Uh, I drove in my police vehicle down toward the area um, that I just heard repeated over and over on the radio where the, the casualties had taken place, um, and that would have been at Maine and Gaspar. Um, and once I got to that position, I, I parked my vehicle as it was impossible to drive any further. Was there a call made for assistance? Yes, I don't know who said it. Um, but an officer used a code um, over the police radio basically requesting police assistance from any officer in the county that would be listening. Did multiple officers respond? Yes. From within Waukesha County? Uh, from within Waukesha Overruled. Uh, Waukesha County and uh, far beyond. Thank you, sir. I don't have any other questions at this time. Mr. Brooks, do you have any qu questions for this witness? Yes, I do. 
Um, good afternoon, officer, first off. Good afternoon. Um, I, I say this is very emotional, so I'm gonna try my best not to keep you up there any, any longer than you would like to be. Um, uh, first, my first question is, I, I noticed that you are in uniform today. Is it fair to say that uh, if you weren't here testifying that you would have been on duty today? Is it fair to ask that or say that? I have been at work today. Hold on one second. I don't know if that was the video messing up or... I have been at work today. Being on duty today, is it fair to ask that or say that? I might have been at work today. I think he said I might have been at work today. I'm not sure. So did you feel the testimony that you would be given at a trial today warranted you to be in uniform? Objection relevant, sir. Sustained. We do not need to answer that, sir. What does his uniform have to do with what you did at the parade? Uh, you said uh, you've been uh, uh, in the... Here you go with this stupid stuff. Duty for 18 years, correct? Yes. Um, it seems like uh, in a lot of these, he's trying more like to... It's more of an attack on the person, like the witness, than it is him trying to like prove any sort of point or anything. Like I noticed that because I've seen another one. He's doing the same thing. He's trying to poke hole or like just. I don't even know. Almost like he's poking fun at him or something. Making fun of him. To make him look silly. You do not need to answer that, sir. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm talking so much I ain't even hear this. Um, come across or had any interaction with uh, the plaintiff in this matter? Objection. Vague. Sustained. You do not need to answer that, sir. Next question, Mr. Brunson. <clears throat> um, how long have you known the plaintiff? Objection. Vague and irrelevant. Sustained. You do not need to answer that, sir. Next question, Mr. Brooks. Did you see the plaintiff in court today? Objection. Vague and irrelevant. Sustained. Next question. <laughs> Do you have any knowledge of that? Objection. Sustained. <laughs> Do you, have you ever even seen the plaintiff in this matter? Same objection. <laughs> what does that mean? Sustained. Um, I want to go to the clip that was just shown. Would you like it shown to the witness again and published to the jury? Um, I'm sure he, would he prefer for it to be so again? I, I just would, want to know if that's what you were asking. You can certainly question him about it and if need be, it can be shown again. Okay, can you show the witness the video clip again? Sure. can tell from my monitor and the witness monitor it is up but it's not being uh, projected to the courtroom other than that and you can go ahead and play it all right your question sir uh, in that clip um, is it fair to say that you uh, can see that there are uh, people walking in the street and on the sidewalk. Would that be fair to say? Yes, I could see that in the video clip. Do you see anybody being targeted or being um, in, in a panic to get away from the vehicle? No. Do you see the said driver of that vehicle intentionally trying to hit anyone in that video? No.
So, um, again, I would, I would ask, uh, were you brought here today to testify on behalf of the plaintiff? Objection, answer, answer. Sus uh, Sustained. He already answered that he was, why he's here. Again, I would ask just one more time for the record. Do you see the plaintiff in court today? Objection. Sustained. Do you have any other questions, Mr. Brooks? Do you know of the plaintiff at all whatsoever? Objection. Sustained. He already asked them. No okay. further questions. All right, thank you. Any redirect? No. All right, thank you, Sergeant. You may step down. Is he released from his subpoena? Yes, please. All right, thank you. He's released. Hey, really quick on the record, if I may. Um, we're going to call the next witness. Do you have a? We have the jury in the courtroom. Do you have a question, sir? Uh, I'll have a. a Subject matter. Motion. I would like to to be put on the record. If you have a motion, you'll have to wait until after the next witness is called. Write it down, submit it on paper, and I'll review whether it's appropriate for this court to address. All right, the state may call the next witness. The state calls Corey Runkle. All right. Good afternoon, Ms. Runkle. If you would please make also your way to, say, to the witness. Yo, shout out to the Law and Crime clerk, Channel. Please remain standing. Raise your right hand. My clerk uh, I'm going to add this stuff to the, the description because I notice I haven't been doing that. Like, I'm, I apologize about that. Well, I, just, uh, I do want to make sure they get their credit because this is coming from their channel. So that's crazy for me to even forget something like that. But um, their information will be in the description of this video and all the other ones. So if you want to find their content, you can just go in the description of this and they'll, they'll be in there. Thank you, ma'am. Please have a seat. We'll get that settled. And then the first thing I will ask you to do, <coughs> excuse me, is to state and spell your first and last names for the record. I wonder who this is. And it's spelled K O R I R U N K E L. Thank you. Go ahead, your witness. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Runkle. Do you know a person named Erica Patterson? Yes. How do you know that person? Uh, from the shelter. What shelter are you talking about? Women's shelter. What city is the women's shelter in? Uh, Waukesha. And when did you meet Erica Patterson? Around probably October, I think. Okay. You are not used to testifying in court, right? Not really. I'm going to ask you to scoot a little bit forward. Mm -hmm. The nice lady in front of you is. Microphone a little bit, hold closer. Yeah. I think that will help. Thank we you. just have to make sure that everybody can hear, especially the court reporter in front of you, because she's writing everything down. Okay. Okay. So can again, can you answer when did you meet Erica Patterson? Either October or November. Of what year? Uh, 21, this year. 2021? Yeah. Okay. Did you meet her at the women's shelter that you're yeah. talking about? Okay. What was the, your living arrangements at the shelter? Okay, it wasn't, it wasn't this, this year, it was last year, I think. 2021? Yeah. Okay. And what um, were your living arrangements at the women's shelter? Uh, we were bunking together. You and Erica? Yeah. Okay. While you were bunking together with Erica at the women's shelter, did Erica ever talk about a boyfriend of hers? Uh, it wasn't her boyfriend. Okay. Did she ever talk about a man? Yeah. And what, did she ever provide the name of that man? Yeah. What was it? Daryl Brooks. Okay. Uh, were you with Erica on the afternoon of November 21st, 2021? Yes, until I split up with her. 
Okay, can you tell us where you were with Erica before you split up with her? I forgot what park it was, but we were at like the park where the dragonfly was, except for we were at the docks. Is that in Waukesha? Yeah. Okay. And uh, the docks, are you talking about a river? Yeah. So the park by the river? Yeah. Okay. What were you doing with Erica in the park? Hanging out. Okay. Was anybody with you? Yeah. Kyle. Okay. And you mentioned that you split up with Erica at some point. Is that right? Yeah. Do you remember why? To go hang out with Nick. Do you know Nick's last name? Uh, Kirby. Okay. And Erica didn't go with you? No. Okay. So what happened after you split up with Erica? Uh, she met up with Daryl. How do you know that? Uh, because she was on the phone with him and they said that they were going to meet up. Now, before that day, November 21st, had you ever met Daryl Brooks? No. You'd only heard his name from Erica? Yeah. Okay. After you split up with Erica and she went to hang out with Daryl, did Erica ever contact you, contact you or Nick after that point? Yeah. How did that contact take place? How did... Was it, again, did she like see you or did she call you? No, she happen? called me on my cell phone. Okay. And what was the nature of that conversation? Uh, that he was beating her up and he was following her. Okay. What did you do when you learned this information from Erica? Uh, me and Nick started running um, to where she told us she was. Where was that? Uh, by the school. Okay. I forgot what school it was, but it was by the school. All right. Did you find her? Yeah. Do you remember where you found her? Uh, right in front of the school. Okay. Do you remember what was happening? When He's you some found good her? friends. Uh, he you don't meet a lot of friends like this these her. days. When you say he, who are you talking oh, about? Oh, Daryl. They have your back and stuff. Daryl, the person? Yeah. Okay. Did you hear... Uh, Daryl saying anything to Erica at that time? He was yelling at her to get back in the car. Okay. Did she? No. She tried, but I pulled her away. Okay. Uh, before you testified Sorry. today, you reviewed a couple of surveillance videos. Is that right? Yeah. No, not today, but a while ago. A while ago, not yeah. today. And God knows what he would have done to her. She would have got back in the car, you know. I'd like that to might have been a whole different story for the witness for identification. What? This dude is gonna spend the rest of his life in prison at some point. Like, he's just that type of dude. He's gonna kill somebody, and it's messed up that it actually happened. Like, We're going to play a few moments from this video. I want you to watch and see if it's I the heard same somewhere video that, that we've uh, reviewed previously. He was okay, out so on we're bail. We're going to play about 10 seconds here. For some other crime he did. I don't know I what it was he did. Sort of walking up. Okay. Uh, let's pause there. So you viewed this video. Is it an accurate depiction of how the events unfolded in front of the school you're talking about? Yeah. I move Exhibit 3 into evidence and ask to publish. Any objection, Mr. Brooks? Uh, yeah, my, my objection would be uh, you've only played five seconds of the video, whereas the other five, you just said ten seconds that you would play. I'm curious to see the rest of the video. Um, your objection is noted. It's overruled. This is for foundation uh, to establish it's what the witness is going to testify about. She's testified. It's a fair and accurate depiction of what the events that unfolded in her presence and um, I will receive exhibit three permission to publish as granted all right we're gonna hit play from the beginning
There's his car. Let's, Let's hit a pause. Okay. Let's hit pause. We are at 16 seconds. We saw a person wearing a blue shirt walking from the left. Do you know who that person is? Erica. Erica Patterson? Yeah. And when you you said, there's his car, what car were you referring to? The red one. The and SUV. do you know who was driving that car? Daryl. Daryl Brooks? Yeah. Okay. And again, this would have been the first time you ever saw Daryl Brooks, is that yeah. correct? Okay. Um, we're going to resume from that point, but wait until I pause again to speak again, okay? I'm sorry. That's okay. So we'll, we'll play from 16 seconds. But yeah, I heard he was out on bail for something. I'm going to probably look that up in a little bit. It's crazy to think if he wouldn't have made bail, a lot of this could have been avoided. But... She's still looking at a video. I must be showing her the whole thing, I think.